I wear to all lovers of the Middle Ages. Today let's talk about mercenaries as a social phenomenon and let's take the period of the harsh Middle Ages. At that time new types of state began to actively develop. The economies also started to become much more complex. All these changes had a significant impact on the nature of military service and also on the organization and execution of wars. When considering mercenary service as a phenomenon of professional service for money, it should be noted that the idea of payment of wages already existed in regular military units of all kinds and grades. Such payments were, however, irregular, but in any case, soldiers received some money from the Roman period until the transition to modern times. During the Middle Ages, the main form of service was when a vassal served his liege lord, and during military campaigns he joined the army and received a fixed salary. Feudal contracts at that time were rather complicated. For example, in one Scottish company a free peasant, participated in a campaign as an archer, was obliged by his contract to fire only three arrows at the enemy, after which he could just turn around and go home. But in reality, of course, such contracts were inconvenient for the army command, and so they could offer to such a conscript the opportunity to serve for a longer period, but no longer for free. It should also be kept in mind that vassals were subordinate to a liege lord by virtue of duty, but vassals tried to keep their obligations to a minimum. This was because the medieval world of those years was effectively much bigger than the present one. For example, it took quite a long time to travel 1000 km, and a knight from central England obviously would not have been interested in a war on the other side of the world, because while he was fighting in a French province, his cunning neighbor could seize his castle and lands. This is why knights tried to keep their commitments to a minimum. The process of changing from conscription to salaried military service was rather lengthy, especially considering that knights and suzerains were not interested in simply parting with their money. In any case, soldiers were entitled to some sort of allowance, if only because the campaigns were very long, and things such as the loss of a horse in battle or damage to equipment had to be taken into account, and soldiers had to make up for these losses somehow. Of course, mercenaries could theoretically plunder the civilian population, but this was not always successful or politically acceptable. In any case, even at the preparation stage of the campaign, the king or lord negotiated with his vassals and knights matters such as wages, payments for loss of horses and equipment, and rules for ransom and prisoners. Captured prisoners usually generated a good ransom, and this usually far exceeded other types of income, especially if the campaign was successful. This practice became widespread till the 14th century, and a feudal lord could count on getting his share of the loot after a successful campaign, or even getting a piece of land from the conquered territory. It is worth mentioning that the distribution of lands and castles after a successful campaign was usually a political gesture to achieve certain goals among the elite. In the Middle Ages, no king gave away landed titles lightly. For common people, the main sources of income were loot and prisoners of war. As a rule, the loot was divided as follows. One third to the lord, one third to the commander, and the remaining one third was divided among his men in different proportions, depending on their status and position. Occasionally, there were some additional nuances. For example, the king who led every campaign could sometimes lay claim to the captured prisoners, and the owner would receive a small reward from the king, after which the prisoner would be at the king's mercy. And then, the king could negotiate with his political opponent for a ransom, but the amount would be much higher. In this way, he gained a financial advantage. Or the king could request cession of territory or recognition of rights to something, which was more of a political benefit. Now, let us consider the question of payments. They were already fixed trace, although they changed over time. They also could be different in different kingdoms, but the general principle of payment had been preserved for quite a long time. The highest rate went to a commander, 
he led a squad of several knights, with squires and also archers and infantrymen. After the commander, the knights were played well, followed by the squires. It should be kept in mind that the squires were usually the same knights, but without formal initiation. By the 14th century, interest in this procedure had already decreased. This was because it implied quite high costs both for the ceremony itself and for maintaining the status of a knight. Archers were the next well paid after the knights and squires. The size of their payments often depended on whether they had a horse. Because the horse at that time was a fighting unit and a mounted archer could be faster and more mobile. The lowest wages were received by spearmen and unspecialized workers. The wages were barely sufficient, kind of analogous to the modern minimum wage. On this sum a warrior could live without luxury, buy a piece of bread, cheese and wine to sustain himself, but it was insufficient to support a family or to rent a house. Now, after talking about wages, let's look at another interesting aspect, namely the relationship between allies. As a rule, when a large feudal lord or king started a war, he often called on allies to help him. However, nuances often arose. For example, if the English king was at war with a French king and needed to find allies on the continent, e.g. in Flanders. However, the Count of Flanders was located between England and France, effectively between a rock and a hard place. He would have to balance his situation carefully to ensure the greatest benefit to himself and his possessions. For example, in the 12th century the Count had an alliance contact with the English king and had to provide a few hundred soldiers in the case of war with the French. Unfortunately, the Count had a similar agreement to provide the French king with a few dozen soldiers. So, it could happen that the Knights of Flanders were divided, some having to fight for the English and others for the French. Such cases were not uncommon, and often the Count could send his eldest son to a major war and his youngest son to a lesser one. If a powerful lord had alliance contests with both sides in the same war and was not sure who would win and which side to take, could send one son to fight for one side and another side for the other side. And so, in theory, the sons could even fight directly against each other. However, this did not usually happen, since in the Middle Ages each military unit had its own banners and emblems and it was not a problem to recognize friendly colleagues in the enemy's army. And now, let's take a look at mercenaries as a social phenomenon. The use of hired warriors was very common in Italy, which consisted of a large number of small city-states. Here, missionary warriors could always easily sell their services without losing reputation, because it was believed that if you fight for one side, you must fight for it to the end, and to switch to the other side could be seen as a betrayal and no one would want to deal with such a warrior again. For this reason many mercenaries tried to go to Spain, where they could earn money without losing their reputation. For example, the Catalan company was a well-organized classic mercenary force, formed at the end of the 17th century, during the Sicilian wars from Catalans who had proved themselves in war. But when the war ended, several thousand men were suddenly out of work. Here, we should consider that for the Middle Ages a detachment of three to five thousand men was quite an impressive force. In addition, it was a well-organized structure with a captain, treasurer, chronicler and even its own accounting department. As their combat skill improved, these knights became full-time professional soldiers and their way of life became almost entirely war-related. But for the most part, simple mercenaries usually dispersed back to their homes after the war was over. However, this was, was not always the case. For example, the same Catalan company was betrayed by their former employers, the Byzantines, when their captain was killed. The Catalans then conquered part of Greece, where they created their own state 
in which we settle down. Generally, it should be borne in mind that medieval society had a different attitude towards war compared to the modern mindset. War was usually a permanent feature. If someone had been involved in war for many years, it gradually became his main source of income and way of life. This was true both for knights and for common soldiers. They were conscripted and, over time, became professional mercenaries. Usually, the organization of military personnel in the Middle Ages was as follows. A knight typically had two or three squires who served him, carrying weapons and helping him to put on his armor. There were also a few additional warriors, who, who, who supported the knight and covered his back in battle. At the same time, archers and spearmen, upon arrival to the army, were usually immediately distributed among the detachments. Therefore, when hiring soldiers, a feudal lord did not separately hire archers, spearmen or other specialists, but simply hired one knight, who already had his own men with him. This was the simplest way to recruit warriors, but the situation was variable. For example, very often England recruited archers as a separate unit, or during the Hundred Years' War, the knight might organize special units that could exist for several years. They were in fact an independent unit in their own right, and were fully financed by the king. But if their pay was suddenly cut off, they simply dispersed or went in search of another war and a new client. For example, after a peace between England and France in 1360, many soldiers from both sides joined the war in Spain, between two claimants to the throne. Often the result of this practice was that a knight could serve the king on one day with his soldiers in a local conflict, but if war suddenly broke out elsewhere, he could leave. For example, according to a famous chronicle of a duke of the Bourbon dynasty, after a long campaign in France against the English, his knights requested permission to go to Prussia. We wanted to winter there, instead of going home, in order to fight against the pagans. It should also be borne in mind that these military activities were not always performed for money. For many ancient knightly orders, war also provided a certain status and held special significance. So, to conclude our story, let's discuss a final interesting example about the life of mercenaries, which demonstrates people's attitude to them. The knight d'Albret was defended one of the fortresses in the south of France against the Duke of Lancaster. The siege had already exhausted the Lelbre's strength and he had no chance of withstanding it, but he continued to resist anyway. During negotiations, the Duke asked him in amazement why he resisted so stubbornly. The knight replied that he was a soldier hired by the King of France, but he had not sworn allegiance and was not a vessel, and hence was not required to fight to the last man. In other words, he was just a mercenary soldier, but he did not surrender the fortress simply because he was a professional and wanted to do his job well. This attitude made the English army respect the mercenaries, and they eventually persuaded the Duke, after the surrender of the fortress, to release the French warriors for a ransom. On that note, let's end our discussion about mercenaries in the Middle Ages. I hope that this information was useful. If you wish, you could subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!